Hello and good evening, friends. Welcome to yet another edition of Asian Just Webinars. Today, we are going to learn about surgery for pediatric CVG anomalies and hybrid treatment of AVMs and other cerebrovascular lesions from two great teachers. The first speaker for today is Professor Nobuhito Morata from Japan. Professor Morata is the Associate Professor, Director in the Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Ketasato University School of Medicine, Sagamihara, Japan. Professor Morata specializes in the field of pediatric neurosurgery, brain tumors, hydrocephalus, functional neurosurgery, intraoperative neurophysiology, and spinal surgery, including craniovertebral junction surgeries. He is an executive board member of Japanese Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Pediatric Neurology, Spinal Surgery, Spina Bipeda, and Asia Australasia Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. He is an integral part of the ISPN, and he is also on the editorial board of the Child's Nervous System. He is a noted author who has published several manuscripts in various peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. We are extremely thankful to Professor Morata for accepting our invitation to be a speaker for today's webinar. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Yuan Li Zhao. Professor Zhao is a professor and director, Department of Neurosurgery, Beijing Tiantan Hospital, Capital Medical University, China. He is also the professor and chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Peking University International Hospital. He is the current secretary of the Chinese Neurosurgical Society. He is an active member of the AANS and is also the editorial manager of the Chinese Neurosurgery Journal. We are so thankful to Professor Zhao for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. The chair for today's webinar is our honored guest from Multan, Pakistan, Professor Anila Darbar. Professor Darbar is currently medical director, head of neuroscience, senior consultant in neurosurgery at the Mukhtar A. Sheikh Hospital, Multan. She is a former assistant professor of neurosurgery at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. She is a diplomat, American Board of Neurosurgery, and was a former faculty at St. Louis University, Missouri. She is the first U.S. trained female neurosurgeon of Pakistan, and she has received several honors and awards during her outstanding career, including the Teaching and Humanitarian Award at the Sunny Syracuse and Outstanding Young Alumnus Award by the Doe Graduate Association of North America. She is a member of the CNS Walter Dandy Society, and she has also pioneered the WINS chapter within the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons. She is an avid speaker at local and international conferences as well as international conferences on women empowerment. She is also a noted author who has published several manuscripts and book chapters in neurosurgery in her vast lustrous career. We are extremely honored to have her today to chair this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the STNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely welcome both the speakers and the chair for today to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I kindly hand over this online platform to Professor Darbar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, mm -hmm. all the participants and uh, both the speakers. And, uh, you know, we are very honored, uh, Professor Yakukoto, who has been the silent warrior of uh, neurosurgeon and has been conducting these educational seminars through decades now, and her services are immense in neurosurgery. And thank you very much for the ACNS Education Committee uh, to uh, host this webinar. And uh, we are very honored that we have two very celebrated and illustrious speakers with us. And uh, we will, of course, go one by one. Uh, Dr. Nibuhu uh, Morota would be uh, our first speaker. And he is an illustrious pediatric neurosurgeon. He has many accolades that uh, Raja already said, so I will not repeat again. But in, within his belt, it's pediatric neurosurgery, spine neurosurgery, spina bifida, epilepsy, functional, so you name it, and his CV is probably full of it. So I would like to invite Dr. Professor Morata, and he will be speaking about the pediatric cerebrovascular junction surgeries. Okay, today I'm going to talk about pediatric craniobatibular junction surgery. Now, this is a one-year-old boy with the 55 syndrome. And uh, if you look at these pictures, the uh, question is what is normal or abnormal in the craniobatibular junction in this boy? And what is the criteria of the surgery in the craniobatibular junction region? This is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And regarding the surgery of the cranial junction, there is some specific point you, you, must, you need to understand. Uh, the first thing is the bony anomaly based on the congenital or systemic disease uh, predominant in pediatric spinal surgery. And the normal anatomical landmarks are uh, often lost, and the surgical principles in adult cases cannot be applied in most of the cases in pediatric spinal surgery. 
and uh, difficult in Peter Kony, but the junction is somehow uh, classified into this point. The first thing is a limited number of cases, uh, just with really low pathologic condition and highly abnormal surgical anatomy with the anomalous syndromes. Uh, the immature spine and the choice of procedure or approach are very much restricted. Uh, the fixation is not easy, it's usually very tough. Instrumentation, not easy. Or sources, say it's a hard external uh, fixation. You often, uh, it's very much complicated and everything is not straightforward. So this is the one year old boy with the condo dysplasia punctator. Uh, this condition itself is a very, uh, very rare condition. And uh, this boy show, present with the tetraparesis. And you see the uh, spinal cord damage uh, caused by traumatic syringomyelia uh, due to the instability of the cervical spine. Uh, this is a correction, but with the extension, somehow these deformities are uh, reduced. So uh, I decided to open the patient. So this this is a photograph of the, with head traction and uh, exposure and using this tape shaped uh, wire. Uh, the cervical spine is fixed with the, using the deep bone graft. And then we were uh, monitored during the surgery. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, the, the boy was placed for her external fixation of the surgery for three months like this, uh, the, <coughs> okay. Uh, I, and the, in her fixation in this case and the other cases, I usually use six pin fixation. And so far for the last uh, 18 years, I have operated on 139 uh, surgery, pediatric chronic junction surgery in 129 pathologies in 126 children. Uh, the background of the disease is uh, like this. So the, the first thing I'm going to talk is the developmental anatomy of the chronic vertebral junction. This is very basic for understanding the pathologic condition of the pediatric chronic vertebral junction and the surgery for the anomaly in the chronic vertebral junction. I mean, either this anomaly means uh, 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 a, uh, I don't have shared dislocation mainly. And if I have time, I talk a little bit about the surgery of achondroplasia and carry malformations. So the developmental anatomy of the current vertebral junction that shown here, and the gestational date 22 to 39, this is a pre lagunar stage, and followed by condrification and then ossification. And as you know, this uh, to have the uh, sleep segment uh, com com so, uh, combined, uh, composed to form the C2. And uh, from somite to skeletal, there's a separation and the resegmentation. And uh, not cold is separated to the rostral and caudal and then uh, this segmented and uh, combined. And the lateral skeletal becomes the pedicle and lamina and the actual skeletal becomes the vertebral body. So uh, this is the picture of the previous, uh, the, I showed you the, the, my first slide. <clears throat> so these abnormal fusions, uh, the remnant of separation failure. Uh, the, this, uh, Defect is this is caused by discrimination failure. So the near cranium and the spine are formed by either membranous ossification or endochondral ossification. Membranous ossification is the frontal, parietal, upper spur bones, and temporal bones. Uh, this area. This is the same. Patient uh, with a mild meningo cell. This is day one, and this is uh, at six years old. And uh, 
and control ossification is the, this lower part of the occipital bone to the spine. And this is a somite and the relationship with the somite and skeleton. And the somite, uh, as I mentioned before, the somite separate the rostral and caudal and re segmented and forms the uh, skeleton. And uh, so this uh, foramen magnum is caused by fractures from the first somite. And uh, this uh, odontal process comes from the, this ocean process, and but this part comes the skeleton one, and this is skeleton two uh, to the rostral part and the caudal part. And below C three, there's a one to one uh, relation to the skeleton and the spine uh, spine level. So this comes from fractures, and this comes the skeleton one, skeleton two, skeleton three. Uh, this is the back, uh, the anatomic background of the craniobatal junction. And the ligand ossification. Uh, this is a shows a picture of C1 ossification, and uh, the C1 is formed from one anterior and two. Uh, neural arches. However, this anterior arch is only present at 20% at birth and it becomes visible by one year old. So if you look at this, uh, this is say five months old baby. You can see the C1 uh, tubercle, but this it's not ab uh, abnormal. This is only in, on the uh, developmental process. And uh, around three years old, this posterior synchondrosis uh, fuse. And by the age three to eight years, the whole uh, synchondrosis fuse and forms a C1. The C is much more complicated. There's a more uh, ossification center. This is a gestation age seven weeks, and this is at the birth. And this apical uh, ossification center appears later, two, three years. And uh, as you know, this uh, subdental synchondrosis, this is sometimes uh, misdiagnosed as a fracture. So you have to be careful about this uh, subdental synchondrosis. And this is the process of the ossification of axis. And uh, it's not easy to understand everything, uh, but what you need to know is uh, this process finish six to 12 years old, uh, late. Uh, this shows uh, uh, one ossification start and the frame completed. And regarding C1, tuberculum starts ossification six months to two years and completed six to 13 years. And the uh, regarding access C2, post terminal is here, uh, starts two to three years. It starts classification two to three years and completed six to, six to 12 years. And in this case, you see that there's two uh, remnants of the ossification center, bilateral ossification center. And uh, then central synchondrosis, oh, sorry, here. This uh, start ossification six to five years and the finish complete uh, ossification six to 10 years. So in all, uh, you know, the, if the patient is 15 years old or older, you can, you think the patient has an adult form of the ossification in the craniobatibular junction. Okay. So the, there's a several, Craniobatibular junction anomalies. Uh, most of them are very known, but less common. Some, uh, you know, only takes a bit, but sometimes you, you may encounter like this. This one caused by segmentation failure. And this one, this is a fixation failure. And this one, this is a developmental problem with a minor charm or something. The diagnosis of these pathologies, uh, this is the adjust assimilation. Here and here, 
this is hyperplasia and hyperplasia. And this is also dontoidium. So this, but the surgical indications for these conditions, this is my, uh, my uh, classification, very simplified. You know, the clinic vertigination anomalies, uh, first we think about if there's any neural compression. If there's no, no neural compression, maybe you can just say observation, don't touch it. And if there's any neural compression, and if there's instability, then you go to the fusion with or without the compression. And there's only uh, neural compression, the no instability, then you do only the compression. And first, I, so, so the, today I'm going to talk mainly about this uh, condition. So the <clears throat> degree of uh, alternative shade dislocation is generally more for, uh, pronounced as surgical uh, instability due to users because the pediatric uh, these structures are very supple and relax and easy to slide. On the other hand, these conditions, uh, manipulation and the destruction of the facet and the realignment are relatively easier, much more easier than that case. So even th like this case, you can uh, reduce and fix uh, uh, upper cervical fusion. This is three year old girl with the delayed motor development. Do uh, you know this? Uh, there's also dontoidium here, and this is a fraction, a neutral portion here, but in extension, this, uh, this uh, dislocation is reduced. And the C1 is relatively formed well, so I decided to make the only C1 since the posterior fixation. So this is a head portion with a, a traction with the neck moderately extended. And I have a set of uh, bone graphs from the skull. And this is skin insium. And this is a uh, foramen magnum, uh, uh, magnum and C1 is here. Uh, this tape uh wire was passed under the C1 scissor and how is it uh, skull was fixed over the C1 scissor and the place for hello for three mass and get this uh, sort of uh, fusion and uh, the baby fine with uh, no problem in bogging so to the on the other hand the C1 hyperplasia present uh, C1 is not much mature enough. You can't use uh, C1 uh, for the fixation, and you have to take the C1 off and then make upper cervical fusion like this. So uh, the basic surgical procedure for uh, occipital cervical fusion is uh, the first is the uh, MVP mounting. MVP mounting start from the before taking the position, you take the bas basic motor potential. Then you take the position and then you check the MEP and confirm there is no neural compression and no change of MEP. And head traction with, like this to keep the reduced induction position. And uh, like this, C1 is really have a page or C1 is not reliable, uh, then you make a C1 laminectomy and then take a bone graft. I usually take a parietal bone and the fixation using non absorbable polyethylene tapered cable. This is a, a next bone cable uh, I usually use. And then press a hard extender fixation like this. <clears throat> I uh, usually uh, use a six point, uh, six pins, and you need to fix uh, two, two and a half months or three months. And the first two months, generally there is no problem. But the last one month, uh, there's some skin infection, uh, uh, loosening, uh, and you have to change the po po position of the fixation uh, case by case. So the, this is a uh, way how I do the, how, uh, 
is a fixation. I, I fixed the hello before surgery and uh, using uh, six pins. And sometimes if there's any deformity, I, in this case, I use only five uh, pins. And the pressure is a 2.5 to 4 pound weight. Uh, and uh, 10 and a half to three mass fixation. And after the uh, hair fixation, I usually use uh, a cervical thoracic or sources for the next six months. And this is a, <clears throat> a four year old girl with the Merlinid syndrome and known for the macrocrania and the specific consumption. And uh, this patient showed the unknown delay in motor function and the uh, routine CT revealed this AAD. And if you look at this, uh, this is the level of the problem magnet. And you don't understand what is, what is part, unless you see, the, you see carefully about this 3D decontrasted issue. And uh, this one, uh, th this number one is uh, here, the orthodontoid. And the two, this is the odontoid process. And this small one, small fragment, this is that type of process C1, this one, uh, this one. And uh, this one is a hypertrophied uh, superior facet of the left C1. So in this case, the, in the same way, I place in the patient with the uh, uh, hero and uh, retracted with the neck extend, uh, moderately extended in the reduction position and harvest the bone flap from the head from here and uh, fix. Oh, sorry. So this is the, from a magnum. This is after the C1 laminectomy and sits here. And this is a small bar hole I made. Uh, this uh, tape for past from the, this uh, bar hole to the, under the seat. And then the bone flap are placed uh, here at, and the fix is using this tape shaped wire. <clears throat> and uh, this is a multiple potential before positioning and after positioning, there is no change. And in the surgery, the MEPU has been monitored and this is post up and there is no change in multiple potential. So you are sure uh, the patient motor function is okay. In this special case, uh, what happened to the next year is, uh, okay, the, the patient was placed of all had of external fixation for three months for the basalic brace and became able to work with the broker. Maybe the bone graft absorbed the, the process, this process, and the vertical uh, dislocation developed a year later. <laughs> so what I did is uh, um, instrumentation, oxygen instrumentation using this uh, uh, instrument and the deep graft that harvested and the place for the body fixation. So th this is another case of the three-year-old boy with the congenital anomaly syndrome and showed dyspunia, tetraparesis, and dysphagia. And this is a uh, 3D CT. So what's the diagnosis in this case? So the defect of the sigma anterior tuberculum and the sigma hypoplasia and the ARF, somehow forget it. And the few to see three. This is my uh, diagnosis. And uh, okay, this is before surgery. And this is after surgery. Uh, I did this for the fixation. Yeah, this is a post up uh, picture of the patient. Uh, this is the job and the hero fixation. And uh, after hero, I placed the patient in this uh, cervicothoracic uh, orthosis. Yeah, so if we take a look at this very extended position. This makes surgery very difficult. 
but this makes the patient safe and the reduction portion is maintained by this extension. So the recent technical advancement is also introduced for the pediatric chronic vertebral junction surgery. This is a six years ago with the AAD, with also odontoidium, again here. And I use this uh, navigation procedure for the placement of scissor pulse screw. So this patient was placed for the C1 hook and scissor pulse screw and uh, then uh, it's a med load that press here and uh, the dip. And this is cross up like this. And this patient had a very thick oxytar at the marginal sinus. Uh, anyway, so like this uh, navigation, instrumentation with navigation is a recent advancement. And whenever possible, I use this procedure too. And also there is some uh, advancement in the surgical technique. And what became uh, apparent is that unilateral instru instrumentation it sometimes works. This is a six year old boy with multiple anomaly syndromes, AAD, AAR, CCC dislocation. And so far he, before surgery, he experienced several times with uh, this arrest uh, due to uh, the cervical compression. And this uh, fraction, even extension, there's no reduction, but with traction and extension, the, this condition improved. So I operated. But the, but the problem in this patient is uh, this is a, a 3D CT with a, a CT angiogram. Showed, and this CT angiogram shows uh, this left vertebral artery came out from C2, C3. This is a normal variant. But what it means is that you can't use this left side for the instrumentation. I use only for the left side. Uh, this is uh, first demonstrated by Brooke Myers group from Utah. The unit of fixation for children of cervical instability in children with congenital vertebral anomalies with vertebral junction. And after I read this paper, uh, I decided this patient to operate uh, for the injector instrumentation. So what I did is a reduction by head traction, C1 laminectomy, Oxford C5 instrumentation, right to see the power screw, uh, and the right C5 lateral mass screw, uh, and the bone graft, and hard external fixation for just for in case uh, I make sure. Uh, um, yep. <coughs> Uh, this is a post up and this is a bong, bong, uh, deep bone graph. And this one, this is the instrument on the right side. So put, this is a put up. This is a post immediately post up. This is one year after surgery. And beautiful hospitalization is obtained. Uh, this is x ray of uh, the post, post up one year and there's no uh, instability. So the, we need to, uh, to manage uh, whatever the risk there is. So this is a patient with the uh, malformation with a very severe narrowing of the foramen magnum. And uh, if you look at this uh, MR with superimposed over the uh, severum, you see the very thick oxygen uh, sinus here like this. So during surgery, uh, this is before bond, bond uh, this is after the C1 and the foramen uh, uh, here, and after foramen and decompress, and you see the, here, is, this is the oxygen sinus, and I made the, some uh, cutting of the outer membrane of the dura for duraplasty by ECE method. And this pops up, like this, uh, uh, I think this is very good uh, body decompression. And uh, so if you know your enemies uh, and know yourself, you can win 100 battles without a single loss. This is uh, the art of war by uh, 
since you, this is a very famous Chinese proverb in Japan, and I love it very much. Anyway, so the, this conductivity factor, this is a metabolic disease of bone, uh, bone metabolism, and uh, this is a very tough case. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, I operate about more than 10 cases of the conductivity punctate. Uh, every time I, have, I encounter very much difficulty for surgery. Uh, see these two cases, uh, this is very memorable for me. This is this patient, past surgery is uh, two years old. This is before the past surgery. And that is oxytocicity for serifusion in this case. What happened? is that four years before the second surgery. What happened is dislocation at the CC4, uh, adjacent segment of the fixation. So I did the uh, uh, oxycervical instrumentation like this uh, transfer articular screws are pressed here. And uh, yeah. And this is another patient with two months old and uh, before the first surgery. And the patient showed that with the dyspnea and the tetraparesis. Uh, two months, you know, this is too young. You can't use a hair of fixation. So what I did is just for sebum laminectomy and the press the patient for Gibbs sheerness, uh, scar and cervical uh, Gibbs sheerness. And the patient press on the uh, superimposition with the Gibbs sheerness for fixation. Uh, and at 11 months old, the, the baby became large and had the head circum circumference uh, enlarged and the uh, heart fixation became possible. I did the second surgery with uh, this oxytocicity post repugion and then pressed with the heart external fixation. This is another girl, another patient with the conductive punctata, three years old the girl with the gate disturbance. And this is not a clinical junction, but, uh, but the cervical uh, deformity. But I, I, I just would like to show you how the clinical punctata is tough for neurosurgeon. And this is put up. And what I did is uh, <coughs> C4, C7, posterior fusion with the deep bone graft like this. And this is of pictures. Uh, this is a first up high press in this hard of fixation as you uh, as I present to you. <clears throat> and one year later, this is a little uh, follow up for one year later, uh, sh she admitted. And first I took CAT scan and I thought it's okay. This uh, reduction is maintained. However, when I look at the MRI one year old, uh, one year later, again there is severe uh, compression to the spinal cord. Uh, so I decided to make this uh, for the instrumentation. And under CT navigation, fluoroscope navigation, and under MEP monitoring, uh, CT pulse article screw, C4 lateral mass screw, and the T1 pedicle screw, and the T2 pedicle screw. And uh, the most, this part, the C4 CC laminectomy is done, and hard external fixation was added because this is a case of cranial uh, conductive punctator. But uh, I did uh, this hard external fixation just for one month. And this is a post-op like this. And uh, there's, na there's still uh, narrowing, but the, the compression itself is very much uh, reduced, I think. And this is a case about the invagination. So the, like this case, we have to approach anti, uh, transorally. Actually, this patient had the several surgery, uh, the compression surgery at other hospital, and then he, the patient will refer to me. Uh, and, but if you approach only for transoral, you can approach only this area. 
And if you add this transparter approach, then you can decompress whole this uh, abnormal uh, auto process. So the application of tensor transparter approach like this, I made this module and the approach, and this is after the compression. And this is put up uh, with the uh, single mode here and the post up uh, after the compression, the single mode itself is also improved. And the two weeks later, uh, I did the posterior fusion in this case. Okay. So spend stabilization in children. Uh, uh, you, you have to remember that the children are not little adults, but have their own peculiar problem. Uh, the pediatric spine is generally skeletally immature spine, especially for the children under six years old. And pediatric spine instrumentation needs you have to be always uh, aware of its small in size and immature. Uh, this, this makes the technical challenge. Uh, immaturation, the fusion through the immature spine may cause a gross retardation. And there's many uh, research and many clinical studies about the, this uh, gross retardation, but generally so far, there's no negative uh, research. And anyway, uh, so we did like this surgery. And uh, when you, you operate uh, pedat pronibative junction and the uh, upper cervical spine, uh, you know, this which immature body, body, this makes the dislocation easy to happen and the uh, shallow horizontal oriented facet joint. This is also the reason why this cervical spine also has easy to have this problem. And uh, another problem you, you have to be understand is the head is relatively large for the body size and the small pedicle and the lamina. And because the head is very large, if you do this uh, transarticular fixation, sometimes head disrupts and it makes this procedure difficult. And the selection of the bone graft, uh, how, to, how to indicate where to, you, have, you can harvest bone graft. One of, uh, in my case, uh, short distance like this C3C3. I usually harvest from skull bone graft. And like this long distance, I harvest from the rib bone graft with uh, support with a plastic surgeon or pediatric surgeon, <coughs> general surgeon. Uh, yeah. And I usually don't use the eject bone because the eject bone is easy to be absorbed uh, during the fixation process. The skull bone and the rib bone have the more uh, tight bone segment and uh, usually remains uh, okay, not absorbed so much. And second technique for oxygen cervical posterior fusion is there's several procedures like this. And uh, just oxygen screw fixation, lateral screw fixation, a pedicle pulse at your fixation. These are also or is a procedure for adult patient. And uh, trans articular screw fixation like this, uh, lamina fixation. This is sometimes I use uh, in this case. And uh, the bone grafts are usually fixed using this wire cable. And uh, <clears throat> my experience is very much limited. Only I uh, use the instrumentation for 20 patients, 20 patients, and uh, five months to 15 years, maybe four years. Uh, the children C2, five, and the cervical, 12, and uh, seven instrumentation, all the root. I usually use the order root. And the hardware use uh, fixation was used for 19 cases and the age was five months to 15 years old. Uh, the fusion rate is uh, 
OCS Fusion system and fibrous fusion for uh, the among four fibrous fusion, the three are called the dysplasia punctative. Complication, mostly high uh, devastation infection at pin site or sleep at seven, and the wound infection or penetration by fall like this, this baby, that you know. You have to take this out and fix again. And uh, one case in condition with punctate, when we make a, a bar hole and fix using a wire table, this bone graft turned off. And we made another uh, bar hole and uh, performed the oxyphosophical fusion. So uh, in future, information of whenever possible should be considered. This is, makes the fixation more rigid. And uh, probably the minimum skill diameter is you, you can use in Japan is 3.5 millimeter. And Europe and USA, 2.5 to 3 millimeter screw is available. This makes a much this difference, less than 5 to 1 millimeter difference makes much difference in pediatric case. And navigation helps to perform instrumentation safe and smooth. But uh, you know, the, we are not so much uh, familiar with the cervical uh, uh, spine, spinal uh, navigation and uh, for the spinal spine surgery. And uh, this immature fragile bone in cranial vertebral junction, this is a very tough uh, problem for thinking about the cranial vertebral junction surgery, especially in case of conduct disability punctative. And regarding conduct display punctator, uh, I published this paper uh, three, uh, four years before on general neurosurgery pediatrics. If you have time, please take a look at this paper. And this is a uh, general uh, algorithm for the management of uns unstable pediatric vertebral junction. Uh, if the region is reducible, and uh, the, there's no conductive punct theta, and the silver sketching is fine, then you can move on to the silver cis posterior fusion. Uh, and if the current body junction this is irreducible, or the patient has the conductive punct theta, or silver ossification is not enough immature then you make a silver diameter and oxyposophical posterior fusion. And the uh, oxygen of the cervical span, the size of the cervical span, there, if there's no problem of the fusion with spinal instrumentation, you can do this. If there's any problem, uh, you, are, you feel uh, you are not sure about this issue, then you move on to the standard positive fusion with tapered cable and hard external fixation. Yeah, yeah I like this is Japanese map, uh, North Alps. And this is a very famous rock place. And this one, uh, this is, um, I love to grab this place. Anyway, so the, I, Talk a little bit about this decompression for the cranial vertebral junction. There's a problem magnum in cranial vertebral junction in pediatric is like this. You know, this is two months old, and this is one year, and this is six years. This is the normal uh, children. But when you look at this achondroplasia, child one, child two, here the achondroplasia shows the circumferential stenosis. A child one usually have not so stenosis. Child two, even the following manner is larger because of the congenital hyenation of the cerebral tonsil. Yeah. So what it means, if you do the decompression, you know, Acotoplegia, what is important is that you go lateral, posterior lateral decompression, especially for the lateral, like this enough 
that the decompression is required. As carry malformation one, you don't need to go later too much. Yes, you need the compression uh, with the width of the spinal cord. And carry two, there is even the foramen melon is large, so you don't need to make the foramen melon decompression. What you need is the subical, upper subical decompression. And uh, I discuss this issue in this my pa my paper. Uh, this is also published four years ago. And uh, okay, sometimes you can encounter like this. This is a patient with compromised disease, two years old. Uh, the the patient had much much primary syndrome and tracheostomy down already and the developmental delay. But even in this condition, the, this two-year-old girl have the relatively preserved hand and leg movement. And the dynamic study showed no instability in this case. So what to do? My decision is leave it attached. I'm just observing this tension. The smartest thing in the tight situation is a beta retreat. Don't touch too much. <laughs> okay. Uh, my philosophy inside is the simpler, the better. And the less, the better. The faster, the better. This, uh, this is my uh, philosophy inside. You. And uh, when you do the alpine climbing in the mountain, in the middle of the mountain, there is no Cheers, the applause. The same in surgery. But never give up. If you have to disable children and their family are waiting for your help, your support. Thank you very much for uh, your attention to my lecture. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Morato, for such a fantastic lecture. And so many new things that we have learned about craniovertebral junction, especially in pediatric population. And uh, what we learned that, you know, uh, the, there's bony anomalies, the anatomy is not normal. Do not treat them like an adult, but think that they are like a pediatric yeah. uh, possibility. Uh, yeah. I have a, uh, I also learned that unilateral fixation is also possible. You don't have to do bilateral fixation every single time. And uh, what uh, I have two questions. My first question is that uh, if you are doing a simple uh, Chiari malformation surgery, as you have shown for a magnum decompression, uh, do you only do decompression or do you do decompression and fusion together? And when you do decompression, do you open the dura and do you do, you do duroplasty simultaneously or not? Uh, that depending on the case. You know, I, I usually do the uh, bony decompression and uh, okay, in some case I do just only for bony decompression. This is a case with a bit uh, combined with the other anomaly, bony anomaly. If there's another bony anomaly and uh, associated with carry malformation, I do only bony decompression alone. I don't open the dura in that case. And uh, if the patient shows, the, you know, the pediatric patient sometimes shows the carry 1.5 anomaly. In that case, I open the dura and uh, coagulate the tonsil and then make a duraplasty. And the simple carry one, uh, I make a duraplasty using the East method. The East method is uh, cutting the outer membrane of the arachnoid and open up. So actually, you don't open the dura, but the dura <laughs> itself is enlarged. So, okay. when you, yeah, and the, when you decompression, I do the foramen decompression and the C1 laminectomy, and I never do the C2 laminectomy, even if the tonsil down, uh, tonsil down below C2, because you can easily pull it up yes. after you open the dura. Yeah. Yes, great. And you Thank just need to coagulate it. <laughs> You have to coagulate it, yes. And you do not do fusion in them, correct? Yeah. Yeah. My second question is that uh, in some of the instrumentation that you showed, uh, why did you use a halo when you are actually using screw and rod instrumentation? 
Uh, 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 Basma, please. Some cases you did screw and rod instrumentation at the C1, C2, or even extended junction uh, instrumentation. Yeah. Why did you use halo external fixator after? Uh, for okay, but instrumentation. You mean instrumentation? After instrumentation. Yeah. Why? Uh, why? Why, why halo? Yes. Hello. Why halo? Yeah. In case of conduct display the punctated, uh, the bone itself is very fragile. So the it's, if if the bone is normal, then and you do the instrumentation, you don't need to do the, any kind of fixation. But the conduct display punctata is different, the story is different. Mm -hmm. So I just make it sure to place the patient with halo for several months mm -hmm. and uh, make it sure that the fixation comes perfect. Okay, but, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another case, uh, when I think about heart fixation is that some patient, you know, children, uh, like this children, the hyperactive, hyperactive. Very hyperactive, yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely, uh, yes. Instrumentation is okay, and, uh, okay, cervical also is okay, but hyperactive children. Yes, yes. Can you feel safe? Yes, yes. No, <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, you cannot, yes. Absolutely. In that case, I use a hero. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask if any of the participants have any questions uh, with Professor Murato, please. I think we're going to move to our next speaker, and Dr. Yuan Li Zhao. He is a celebrated neurosurgeon, professor, and director, Department of Neurosurgery, Beijing Titan Hospital and Capital Medical University. He is also editorial manager of Chinese Neurosurgical Journal, an international active member of AANS, as well as secretary of Chinese Neurosurgical Society. Today, he will be talking about hybrid surgery for complicated cerebrovascular, uh, AVM, and other complicated cerebrovascular disease. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. Oh, okay. Thank you for the kind uh, invitation and uh, introduction. So today I, I like to share my uh, experience about the hybrid surgery for some uh, complicated cerebrovascular disease, either uh, like uh, aneurysm, AVM, or some uh, <coughs> uh, carotid occlusion. So uh, let's start uh, <coughs> actually about 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, we start to use the intraoperative angiogram uh, to, <clears throat> to see if the surgery is okay for some uh, like a difficult case. Like this one is a cerebra, cerebellar AVM. So this, the image is uh, <clears throat> right about a uh, uh, remove of AVM nidus, but actually I think there's some uh, residue of the, the, <clears throat> the vein. So, now we have some uh, uh, modern and, and, uh, equipment in the OR, especially yeah, the right. especially the uh, the new uh, angiogram and with the X <clears> three <throat> uh, compatible uh, operating table. So also uh, we need a head fix system also in uh, X-ray compatible. So that's the real uh, OR in, in our hospital. And I think uh, with this hybrid uh, technique, uh, at first we can do angiogram during and after open surgery for uh, uh, immediate evaluation. Uh, also, we can use some um, endovascular technique like uh, balloon, uh, occlusion or some uh, partial amylizations for either uh, AVM or the uh, uh, either aneurysm or AVM. <clears throat> so it's especially partial amylization of uh, AVM or, or some uh, bloody brain tumor followed by open surgery. So <clears throat> we can make the surgery much more safer. Also, uh, in the hybrid OR, the, the neurosurgeon can help the endovascular colleague 
So like uh, if there's something happen, like uh, uh, bleeding during the, the amylization, we can do open surgery, just don't need to move the patient to another room. <clears throat> and also we can treat some other uh, complication. I, I can show you uh, some example later. And uh, we can make the endovascular colleague more uh, confident. So uh, with this hybrid technique, uh, some complicated uh, cerebrovascular disease can uh, become uh, uh, easier to be treated. Uh, for the hybrid OR, especially the intraoperative uh, angiogram, we can know what happened immediately, and then we can uh, um, fix the problem just uh, at the first time, like uh, if there's some uh, aneurysm uh, not complete, uh, uh, clipped completely, uh, then all the, the, uh, the normal artery uh, were uh, clipped, then we can just uh, adjust it right now. Uh, also, uh, it's very important for feeding artery control, which is uh, very important to decrease or stop bleeding to make the uh, uh, surgery become uh, Less uh, complicated, uh, complicated with less complication. Uh, also, uh, it's very useful for young neurosurgeon training, especially for those uh, dangerous uh, like aneurysm clipping surgery. So we can see some cases. This this video is it's uh, this these two video are regular aneurysm surgery. And that's not in the hybrid OR. We can see. Uh, there's bleeding. Actually, the, the bleeding is still not the, the most uh, dangerous one, but also, uh, I mean, kind of scary if the, the young neurosurgeon face such kind of uh, problem. This one, you can see just uh, flip the aneurysm. It's a PCOM aneurysm. And uh, so almost down, but uh, the blood coming. And there are some other cases like the, it's, this is a, a AV fistula uh, amylization, <clears throat> but uh, it's about uh, six years ago, it, the, the case. So there's a lot of bleeding. Uh, so with this, we, uh, now we have the hybrid OR. So we can see for this case, it's a large uh, <coughs> uh, broad artery bifurcation aneurysm. And uh, with the temporal balloon occlusion, we can see the aneurysm become much more easier to be clipped. Actually, this one is before, uh, <coughs> the balloon uh, work, we can see the, the radish and skin uh, AVM uh, aneurysm work. It's very easy to, uh, to rupture things. But after we, uh, we use the balloon here, the, the AVM, the <clears throat> now we can see the aneurysm become a pink, not so radish. And then we can easily put the clippers and then and we can see what happened just uh, <clears throat> in the OR. So that's the MEG, the neurophysiological uh, uh, monitoring to confirm everything is okay. Uh, here is another, uh, actually it's a kind of uh, regular aneurysm, a PCOM aneurysm with some uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, we just uh, want to show, uh, show this case. It's uh, down by uh, the young neurosurgeon in the midnight. So <clears throat> with the uh, balloon occlusion, the surgery become uh, much more easier, especially for such kind of a pecan aneurysm. Uh, we can uh, just um, make uh, confirm the, the, the aneurysm 
was clipped completely and uh, the PCOM <clears throat> can be saved. Well, that's the carotid artery. This is the, <clears throat> the second nerve, an aneurysm just right here. Uh, this one should be the PCOM uh, branch. There are kind of a classification around the, the aneurysm neck, so make the surgery a little bit more uh, difficult. Seems the big PCOM uh, saved, but there's it's not so, uh, it's okay, but not so uh, <clears throat> good for the aneur uh, aneurysm neck. So because there is a balloon in the carotid artery, so the young neurosurgeon uh, don't need to worry about the, the, the rupture of the aneurysm, make them more uh, confident. And this is the, the image <clears throat> right after aneurysm clipping, it becomes saved. Uh, this is the post-operative uh, CT scan. Uh, also, there are some other uh, like uh, complicated uh, cases, coexist AVM and the multiple aneurysm. So with the hybrid uh, technique, we can do the AVM uh, uh, remove followed by the the aneurysm uh, clip uh, uh, coiling. So oh, I just uh, skip this. Okay. Uh, here's another one, a uh, large aneurysm uh, with <clears throat> the balloon works. And then we, at first we put two uh, long, uh, <clears throat> very long aneurysm uh, clipper, but there's still some part of the aneurysm inside the cavernous sinus. So continue to put coils inside the small part of the large aneurysm. But actually this is a, a, a case done uh, about uh, five years ago. Now we, we have the pipeline, <clears throat> so maybe it's now no more uh, necessary for the, those kind of aneurysm to do the hybrid uh, surgery. Uh, here is another uh, interesting AVM case. There's an AVM bleeding, and then uh, and <clears throat> the first uh, surgery is just for the hematoma evacuation. Then we plan to do the embolization for the, the AVM niters. But the, <clears throat> the, the microcatheter accidentally uh, attached by the, the onyx, the grow, it cannot be uh, uh, withdrawn after embolization. So we decide to do the open surgery. The first uh, thing is cut the catheter. And then uh, um, after we uh, cut the acetal, uh, catheter, we saw the AVM maybe uh, uh, already uh, embolized uh, totally, but uh, we do the angiogram during the surgery and just find that some residue of the AVM either. So we continue to move the AVM. Uh, here's the cases, but I don't think. Uh, uh, so, so we can see there's the first uh, surgery to remove the hematoma. And then uh, here's the AVM niters. After embolization, it, it's, uh, it cannot be seen, but uh, because the, the caster cannot uh, take out, so we uh, we do the yeah we do the surgery. Here we can see the catheter inside of the feeding artery. Then we cut it, and then and we can see there's still some uh, AVM uh, niners can be seen. Um, 
So that's why we continue to do the, the open surgery to, to remove the, the residue of the AVM. Then finally, uh, that's okay. Uh, here's another case. It's a, a dural AVF. Uh, first, uh, <clears throat> it's a, the first uh, surgery. As the first operation is a endovascular coiling for the occipital uh, artery. But there's uh, uh, something left. So the patient suffered a, a second bleeding. So the first, the second time we do the uh, coiling <clears throat> through the, the M uh, MMA, the artery, but the, the the bad thing happened again. So we cannot get the catheter uh, out. Then we do the surgery. It's a just a keyhole. Uh, uh, surgery. We don't uh, cut the dural. We just find the catheter, and uh, it's a small <clears throat> burr hole and a small bone flap. And then we find the catheter right inside the MMA. See. Then we just cut it from here. So to avoid the, the complication uh, of the endovascular process. Uh, yes. Uh, here's some more. Uh, actually, I, I remember uh, at the same time there's a, a neurosurgery complication meeting right now in India. So maybe I can. I like to also talk something about the complication. This is a treatment, uh, <clears throat> treat of uh, another AVM in hybrid OR. It's a uh, embolization and uh, got some uh, bleeding after embolization. So immediately we do the EVD uh, to drain the, the blood. So make the patient recovered uh, kind of quickly. That's two weeks after uh, <clears throat> the, the embolization. So all the things done, just done in the operating, uh, the hybrid, hybrid operating room. So that's why the patient can uh, recover uh, quite quickly. Otherwise, uh, maybe we need, at first, uh, if something happened in the Underground <clears throat> room. We need to uh, move the patient to do the CT scan, and then we can need to get a, a consultant opinion from the neurosurgeon, and then uh, maybe it will cost maybe several hours. <clears throat> but in the hybrid OR, we can do it just in ten minutes. Here some other uh, AVM cases, embolization and the bleeding, and then we do the decompression, just uh, same table. Don't need to move the patient somewhere. Mm, the patient, that's two weeks after surgery, after the embolization and after the bleeding. But of course, I think this patient needs another uh, cranioplasty surgery, but it's better than uh, just die. <clears throat> there are some other cases, uh, AVM uh, embolization and bleeding, and then uh, do something just right, the bleeding happened. Oh, uh, so now uh, we, uh, I like to talk something about this, uh, the difficult AVM cases for <clears throat> the grade four, grade uh, five, AVMs. It's not uh, easy to be the to be treated either by a, a single open surgery or by the embolization. But now with the hybrid uh, technique, oh, actually, um, uh, ten years, twenty years ago, which we, we had tried the in in uh, the directly intraoperative embolization for the at that time we don't have the angiogram. Uh, and we don't, we cannot do the 
uh, intraoperative amylization <coughs> in the OR. So we just inject some uh, like IBCA into the, the feeding artery. But it, on, it only can be done if the, the feeding artery on the surface of the brain. So for if there is a, a PCA uh, feeding, <coughs> feeding uh, AVM, we cannot do it. Uh, now, uh, <coughs> with the help of the endovascular uh, technique, we can try different materials like uh, the coil to, for this uh, AVM, most uh, of the blood from the branch of MCA, we can put coiling uh, inside of the feeding artery and then followed by surgery. <clears throat> Actually, the, the, the coiling can be uh, like a navigation to uh, help us to <clears throat> identify the way, which one is, should be uh, cut and coagulate and cut. And that's the uh, angiogram just after resection. Also for some uh, AVM, deep located AVM, the blood from the, the branch of PCA, we can use the balloon to temporarily uh, stop the bleeding from, uh, stop the blood from the PCA to make the surgery become much more easy. During the surgery, we can find the branch from the PCA, which, uh, go inside the niters. And then we put, uh, I put a uh, aneurysm clip there and followed by the removal of the area. So it become much more easier, no more uh, bleeding. So uh, there's uh, some other cases. Uh, if there's the, the AVM, uh, the patient got some uh, epilepsy and the seizure attack, so we can, uh, for those patients, we can do the intraoperative uh, uh, cortical EEG monitoring to, to see if uh, there's still some abnormal uh, uh, EEG <clears throat> after removal of the AVM miners. Uh, here's some other one. We also uh, use the intraoperative, not only in the angiogram, but we also use the intraoperative MR for some uh, special AVM cases, especially we want to see the uh, relationship, the distance between the, uh, the, the, the fiber <coughs> track and the, the AVM neither. And also we want to see the, uh, the cerebral, <coughs> the blood perfusion of the AVM niters and also the surrounding uh, normal brain tissue. So there's kind of a, a explanation of the, uh, you know, the MPPB, the normal uh, per, uh, uh, normal per, uh, profession um, pressure uh, breakthrough. So this is the AVM, uh, the blood mostly before surgery, most of the blood inside the AVM niters. It's the, the ASR sequence of the MR. And after AVM uh, removed, we can see the normal, uh, the, the higher perfusion area uh, go into the normal brain tissue. That's maybe kind of uh, explanation of the MPPB theory. <clears throat> And also uh, the, uh, for the hybrid surgery of those the, the difficult AVM cases, we need a, a comprehensive uh, discussion between the uh, neurosurgeon and the endovascular doctors. For, uh, like for those uh, AVMs, both feeding by the superficial uh, branch and the deep <clears throat> located branch of MCA, as we know, we can imagine that we need uh, the endovascular uh, colleagues. They uh, embolize the, the AVM, uh, mostly the blood from the deep located branch. And for the sup superficial branch, we can easily just coagulate and clip. Maybe we can put an aneurysm clipping also to <clears throat> stop the blood. To make the surgery 
is, and that's the the AVM server. It's totally different uh, with those AVM uh, without any uh, embolization. So the surgery become kind of uh, uh, no blood surgery. And there are some more difficulties like AVM with a large aneurysm can do it both. both. So it's a kind of, uh, it's a summary for AVM hybrid treatment, uh, especially for those diff diffuse or deep located AVM with the risk of uh, bleeding during the surgery uh, and also uh, the seizure attack, even with uh, embolization or surgical uh, <clears throat> resection. So for th those patients, uh, the combination of endovascular uh, embolization uh, maybe uh, one or two gamma knife, and then followed by the open surgery to finally uh, treat them with a better outcome. Also, we used uh, not only the the angiogram in the hybrid, or also the functional MR. Uh, then uh, uh, next uh, next one, I will talk a little bit about the, the ICA uh, occlusion. As we know, the either CET or, C, uh, <clears throat> or CAS, either the under actor <clears throat> acne, uh, the surgery or the stent can be uh, used to treat the, the carotid stenosis. But if there's carot carotid artery occlusion, so we cannot do it just by a surgery or just by a stent. So we can do both to treat them. At first, we uh, just uh, do the CEA to remove the plaque and then followed by the stent to make the occluded artery uh, reopen. <clears throat> After the carotid, uh, the CEA, we can just uh, put catheter from here and then to uh, make sure there's blood goes through the artery. Here we can put one, maybe two, three, four stand, one by one. Uh, yeah, that's, it, that's, it's just a simple carotid uh, artery surgery. But uh, after that, we put catheter. So that's, we, we can see the stand inside. One, two, three, maybe four. So that's the CTA, yeah, CTA after the hybrid surgery. Uh, also for, uh, actually there's some uh, more complex cases like uh, we call it multiple stroke risk factory coexisted complicated cerebrovascular disease. Just like both the patient, uh, the patient uh, have both uh, aneurysm and uh, artery stenosis like this case. So for those cases, uh, this is this is an example. The patient is a thirty-seven years old female with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and uh, uh, it's kind of like uh, aneurysm bleeding. And actually, it it is a aneurysm bleeding. The it's an ACAM aneurysm. But actually, the patient you can see the MCA branch of right side almost uh, disappear. So the patient both, the diagnosis should be a uh, uh, ACOM aneurysm coexisted with the MCA, the right side, right a MCA uh, stenosis, severe stenosis. For, so for this case, we uh, this is the aneurysm. The blood from the left side, but because the aneurysm just uh, located in the midline. So we can do this, both aneurysm clipping and the bypass surgery uh, for the <coughs> right uh, STMCA at one stage. So that's the surgical, uh, the yeah. surgery. It's uh, this one, uh, it's just uh, a regular aneurysm clipping. It's easy, not so difficult. But there's, there's still some blood surrounded uh, uh, and then followed by the aneurysm clip, the first one, the first thing we, we think. And then we uh, followed by the 
STMCA uh, bypass. Uh, here's another one, the aneurysm uh, with the MCA stenosis. We are thinking about uh, aneurysm uh, clipping and then put a stent. But in OR, we, uh, you know, after discussion, we changed uh, our plan. We first we put a caster and uh, put a, a stent, and then we tried to coil it. So it's even in OR, it's not always need to both uh, endovascular uh, procedure and uh, uh, surgical uh, and the surgery. You know, in OR we can in the hybrid OR maybe we can just do one thing, but because it uh, make the doctor more uh, confident, so maybe sometimes we don't need to do the both. So uh, the last part is about the, the brain heart disease. Uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes the, the brain uh, uh, problem caused uh, from the the heart, like the the mix, the aneurysm, some aneurysm, special aneurysm caught not, not because the high blood pressure, uh, but also, but caught, caused from the myxoma, like this. So we should know that some, so sometimes we need to find the, the real problem, not only in the brain, maybe from the heart. And uh, also there's some coexistence of the, uh, brain uh, cerebral vascular disease and uh, heart disease. Like uh, this patient, there's a carotid artery stenosis. Also uh, with the, <clears throat> the carotid artery stenosis, also with the, the coronary heart, the artery from the heart, the stenosis. So for such kind of patient, the regular treatment, maybe we just send the patient to, to one department, either a, a neurosurgery or neurology department, or then uh, the patient need to maybe uh, discharge and then go to the, the <clears throat> uh, heart unit for another treatment. And now we can do it both, just uh, <clears throat> one time, like this one, the heart problem, we can put catheter and then also we put catheter, uh, also we put stent for the carotid artery stenosis. Like this is the heart. Before treatment and after treatment and then followed by the carotid artery surgery. This is the before the surgery, the CA and after CA. Uh, here's another case I think. Uh, yeah. Hard problem solved and followed by the the carotid artery surgery. Uh, okay, I think I should uh, finish here. So <clears throat> the hybrid OR, we uh, we need the new angiogram system, and uh, it's kind of a bigger operating room and the radiation protection. And then the doctor also needs some uh, special training because it's uh, during the surgery, we don't do the angiogram uh, under a, <clears throat> a regular position. So the patient may be uh, turned from the supine to side or even prone position. Then make the, there's some small detail, uh, but we, uh, I don't want to uh, talk uh, right now, but we, we need you to, to know that sometimes make the endogram um, <clears throat> operation more uh, complicated and more di a little bit difficult, but they need some practice. Uh, okay, I think uh, I should finish here. Thank you. 
thank you dr rao for a wonderful lecture on complicated cases and uh, my question to you is that the hybrid or that you showed it was lovely it was wonderful and uh, i just want to know it is a combination of a uh, dsa and uh, and uh, intraoperative mri correct is there any other and neuro navigation or no just the uh, just the dsa and the intraoperative mri yeah, actually, in 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 my uh, uh, hospital, the, the, we have the <clears throat> the hybrid room. That's for the the with the operating table and the angiogram, and just the neighbor uh, room, another room we have the intraoperative uh, MR. So we cannot do the angiogram and the intraoperative Correct. MR at the same time, but we can do it. Just uh, move the if we one, we can just move the patient to get the MR just before and after the hybrid operation. Okay, I think Dr. Raja, I'm going to open uh, the uh, for the any of the panelists if they want yeah, to ask I, any questions to both our speakers. Definitely, the discussion is open now. Before that, may I invite Professor Shubin, he being a hybrid surgeon himself to give his comments also. Okay, thank you, Raja. Uh, Professor uh, Chao Yuanli, he is uh, from uh, Chinese biggest neurological center and the uh, Tiantan Hospital is the biggest one in north of China. And uh, they have a uh, giant hospital mainly for uh, neurosurgery. And uh, the operating room yeah, is huge and uh, uh, every, Equipment, equipment uh, is uh, most of our uh, latest models for intraoperative uh, DSA, like uh, there are phenol uh, Siemens, uh, latest phenol uh, DSA machine. And uh, so you can see uh, Professor Zhao showed a lot of different technique uh, combinations for the hybrid treatment for the vascular disease, yeah. He is the, uh, he, they have a vast experience in this kind of uh, treatment. Thank you, thank thank you, you Dr. Shu. Thank yeah. you, Yuan Li. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. May I invite my co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Singh? Thank you, uh, Raja. Uh, I have uh, some questions for Professor Morota. Uh, professor, uh, Professor Mr. Morota, Mr. thank you for your nice uh, lecture. Uh, I, I, I wanted to find out from you uh, for Atlanto axial dislocation, uh, you perform the, the reduction uh, under neuro monitoring intraoperatively. Uh, may I ask if there is any signal change during your reduction? What would you do? Would you proceed or would you uh, cancel the surgery? Uh, my second question, Prof, uh, regarding the use, use, usage of uh, hollow waste in the pediatric age. Uh, how, how do you determine how much uh, uh, screw pressure? Uh, are you using just by finger twisting to know how much pressure or there's some form of monitoring of pressure of the screw? And uh, how long would you allow the hollow waste to be wear uh, until you, you, you feel that there is a, a mild union or non-union uh, in your, in your uh, uh, bone graft? How long will you allow? Uh, is there any maximum period that you will allow until you tell, you can say that, okay, uh, no point. I, I, there's a, a non-union. Uh, I will not prolong with the hollow waste. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's not easy to, uh, okay. Uh, I talk about the fixation about the hollow exercise fixation. Yes. And okay. uh, as I mentioned in my slide, I usually fix for two and a half to three months. But there is no, you know, uh, definite period. It's okay or not. Okay. And uh, you check the X-ray for the bony fusion. Uh, if there's any bony fusion or not, uh, you can check the CAT scan. But yeah, not completely sure <laughs> at the end of the fixation. Okay. Okay. And uh, what I do is. Uh, Okay, uh, at the end of the fixation, and I try to finish the fixation to change to the uh, cyclostatic orthosis. 
uh, I please bring the patient to the OR. Mm -hmm. And uh, after general anesthesia, uh, the case anesthesia, the halo is removed. Okay. Then I made a dynamic study mm -hmm. and a fluoroscope and okay. to confirm if the fixation is okay or not. There, okay. there is no instability. Then I okay. press uh, a cytochromic or sources. So, okay. yeah. To, so that means that if you fix a patient for two months, it may be okay, but I'm not completely sure. So I just is two and a half to three months. And okay. uh, over three months, you will experience more and more complication. Uh, skin is pin, pin site infection or slip down or whatever. So I think the three months is maximum for pediatric okay. fixation for HALO. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have Dr. Harshal Agarwal who wants to ask his question. Good, good evening, Professor Morota. Excellent lecture by you and by Dr. Zhao. I have a few questions for Professor Morota. Uh, sir, I wanted to know, is there any other alternative to hello fixation? Hello fixation is not really available to us at our center. So we are going with hard cervical collars. So what is your advice to us if uh, we don't have access to hello fixation? The youngest age for hard fixation is, uh, in my case, five months, but it doesn't depend on the age. It depends on the head size. The minimum size of the smallest size of the halo is currently, I think, the 44 centimeter something. So the head circumference is over 44 centimeter or something. Then you can use the halo fixation. It's not depending on the age. It's depending on the head circumference. That is that I, I showed I showed in my slide that the, I use the Gibbs sheen. Yeah, you, you can ask orthopedic surgeon to make a gips for the head or uh, the cranial cervical to shoulder uh, gips sheen, and then you can put the, uh, the young young child on the gips sheen. Right. Is that okay, Asha? Yeah, uh, another question I wanted to ask is for Chiari 2 malformation. Uh, children who are uh, presenting to us at a very young age with respiratory difficulty or uh, loss of lower cranial nerve function. So do you prefer to go in them and do a laminectomy uh, for the uh, compression of the cervical maxillary junction or do you prefer to observe them? Mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, in the case before that the, I make a, only C1 laminectomy for a memorandum decompression and the C1 laminectomy. And uh, open the dura or make a cutting the outer membrane of the dura or leave the dura untouched. That depending on the case. If the bony anomaly is very strong and associated with other bony anomaly, I do only bony decompression alone. Right. <clears throat> I hope that answers it. But may I also mention that these children with Chiari malformation have do have a hypoplastic nuclei also. Yeah. So you may get away with the uh, laminectomy for the time being, but the end of it, they will again come back for some of the other reasons. Yeah, we are not referring to do yeah. a procedure for them. I just want to give opinion on what we do. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Sir. Right. So I think... Care is a big issue, so you can do this in the separate session with taking Definitely. more time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think if there are no more questions, we'll wind this up. I will go back to our chair, her conclusion. Okay, so I think uh, this concludes our ACNS webinar. And uh, I'm again, very thankful to both our esteemed speakers, Dr. Uh, Murata, Professor Murata and Professor Zhao uh, for giving a brilliant lecture. And I think I learned a lot from both the lectures. And I'm sure the participants must have learned a lot. And uh, thank you again for the ACNS president, Jeffrey Yogokato, and ACNS uh, educational uh, uh, committee members for organizing such a wonderful webinar. Back to you, Raja. Thank you. Thank you so much. In that case, we'll wind this up officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yokokato, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Yuan Li Zhao and Professor Noguhito Morota, as well as the Chair, Professor Anil Adarbar, for coming here and teaching us about hybrid treatment and uh, CVJ, pediatric CVJ anomalies. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, my dear co-host Libun, for coming here today. A special thanks to Professor Zubin. Thanks to him for uh, airing this on the WeChat channel. Today we have around 2014 neurosurgeons who are watching this live in different parts of the world. So until we meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you so much, everybody who's joined. And thank you all the distinguished faculties from India, Pakistan, and rest of the world who joined us. Thank you so much.